Hello, my name is Sean Davis and I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Bristol, as well as teaching on the undergraduate courses. I'm also director of the Chemistry Imaging Facility. Within the imaging facility, we've got a range of advanced microscopes, including electron microscopes and atomic force microscopes. During this brief introduction, I'm just going to demonstrate two of our key electron microscopes, the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. We'll start with the scanning electron microscope, and I'm actually going to look at some samples that have originated from final year undergraduate research projects. So these advanced instruments and facilities are available to undergraduate students within the department, principally in the case of electron microscopy, when they come to do their final year undergraduate project. And they actually get taught and get hands-on under normal circumstances, training and application on the microscopes. So when they make things within the research labs, they can come and characterize their own samples themselves. The first thing we have to do is turn the beam off, and then we just vent the microscope so you can hear air rushing into the chamber and it will slowly vent over about a minute and we'll then be able to open the chamber door. So whilst we're waiting for it to vent, just to point out some of the attachments. So this is the X-ray detector. So the silver bit hanging off the side is collecting the X-rays that are being produced from the interaction of the electrons with the sample and taking all that all that information is then analysed on a separate computer. At the top of the microscope we have what's called an electron gun and we'll have a look inside. At the side we have some apertures, so the construction of this microscope is different clearly to an optical microscope. Here we're producing a beam of electrons which are fired down onto the sample. Then most of the detectors are above the sample and are collecting them, collecting either electrons for imaging or x-rays for chemical analysis. When we look inside the microscope, you'll see that the electron beam actually travels down a very narrow channel through this microscope. There's a large base unit. Most of it is just the electronics and pumping system. The electron beam itself is generated in the electron gun. It only fires down a bore about a millimetre wide. So we'll see a bit of the geometry and construction where the detectors are when we open up the chamber door. So removing the sample. Obviously wear gloves, so you don't transfer any grease from your fingers. Inside the chamber, just here you can see the orifice where the electron beam is fired out. Underneath you can see the backscatter detector. And just behind with the Faraday cage on is the, what's called the secondary electron detector. So it's the secondary electrons most of the images that you've seen today will have been collected with. When the electron beams hit the sample, obviously all these signals are being produced all the time. It's really just a case of whatever detectors are fitted to the microscope allows you to collect a range of signals in parallel. For example, like we saw with the elemental mapping capability, which means we can actually collect the secondary electron image as well as the elemental mapping images. So once we've loaded the samples into the microscope, we just click on the electron beam and it slowly warms the filament up until we start seeing an image appear on the display. What you can see is a grayscale image and this is actually just the corner of a slide that's got a sample on. We're currently at a magnification of about 16 times. So these are similar ranges of magnifications that you would get with a normal optical microscope. 
The advantage of a scanning electron microscope is just the ease of operation. So we literally just have to turn the dial and we're zooming into the sample. We're already at 50 times, zoom into 100 times and we can keep going, in this case, until we reach a thousand times. So the image is blurry because it's out of focus, but the green bar that you can see in the video is actually 10 millionths of a meter or 10 micrometers. Focusing, again, is just turning the dial, and in this case, what we're actually seeing, as I zoom back out, is a polycrystalline diamond film. So there's a research group within the department who focus most of their efforts on producing crystalline diamond films. And this is one of the samples from an undergraduate project. You can see the crystalline facets of the diamond film. We can keep zooming in, but obviously, in this case, the grains are in the millionth of a meter size range, so we don't see any more detail in the sample. We've now moved on to the, the second sample, and in this case, it's actually what are called colloidal particles. So these are very small particles, which when they're dried down and deposited on the surface, they close pack together, much like ions within a crystal. At this magnification 50 times, we don't see much structure in the material. But as we zoom in, so we're going from 50 times up to 1,000. We'll just refocus. And you can begin to see some other features. The dark patches here are holes. Now at 10,000 times, what we're imaging is not a crystal. The scale bar, the green bar, is one millionth of a meter. These are small, in this case, silica or glass particles that are of the order of 200 nanometers in diameter. And they just tend to close pack together, just like close packing oranges together, or just like, as I said, ions in a crystal. There are groups looking at making these colloidal particles and controlling their size so that they're all very uniform and then when, they dry, when they're dried down they tend to close pack into this cubic close packed or exactly close packed arrays on a surface. So you should be able to make out the hexagonal arrangement of the individual particles. So these are tiny glass spheres packed together and the space in between the spheres then is also of the order of hundreds of nanometers. So these materials are called colloidal crystals. These are interesting because the dimensions of these particles is of the same order as light. So at the macroscopic level, the effect you see is that we see the white crystalline close packed regions within this glass tube, but you should be able to see the iridescence and the color arising from the interference pattern as the light interacts with these well-ordered features. These colloidal crystals are synthetic versions of, of opal. So the natural mineral or gemstone opal, if you look at it under a scanning electron microscope, it will look exactly like this in terms of being composed of close-packed silica spheres. The final sample we're going to look at is actually a natural photonic material. In this case, it's the underside of a butterfly wing, and you'll see how the butterfly wing itself interacts with light. Here we're just looking at the structure, and you'll see it also contains effectively diffraction gratings, which enable it to interact with the light. So as we zoom in, in this case going up to about 250 times, you can see scales. These individual scales are the bits of dust if you've ever accidentally touched the underside of a butterfly wing. Well, these are the scales that flake off as a self-defense mechanism for the butterfly. So if it gets trapped in a spider's web, for example, it can escape because they're loosely attached. But when we zoom in even closer, in this case, a 
thousand times magnification again. So the green bar is 10 millionths of a meter. We can begin to see regular lines within the structure, much like a diffraction grating. And zooming in, we can see in this case, in contrast to the opal example, which was an inorganic silica or glass material, this is clearly a carbon-based material, so purely organic material. It still has the capability to generate structural color. So the spacing between the lines, in this case, you can see, again, are of the order of the same magnitude as the wavelength of light, in this case, hundreds of nanometers. As well as signals for imaging, when the electron beam hits samples of material, X-rays are also produced. The X-rays are characteristic of the elements in the material. They provide a signature for the chemical composition of the material. This is the spectrum. Here we can identify all the elements and their relative composition. So in this case we can see a strong signal for silicon. But as well as telling us there's silicon in there, because we're scanning the sample, we can actually match the energy of the X-rays with where they've been produced in two dimensions within the sample. So in this magenta map here, we see the element distribution within the sample and see these features are very silicon-rich features within the material. We can then overlay all the maps showing all the different elements and how they're distributed throughout the multi-layered structure of this particular sample. And the relative peak heights then give an idea of the composition of the material. So we can get percentage weight of individual elements within a material. Because we're using the scanning electron microscope and the electron beam is being rastered or scanned across the sample, at each point we are collecting these characteristic x-rays with characteristic energy, so it means we can start plotting out the actual element distribution within the sample. This is an example of a flexible electronic material. Again, this sample formed the basis of a final year undergraduate research project. In this case, they were interested in knowing how well their method for depositing the multi-layers to produce the flexible electronics were working. Morphologically, it was clear. So this is a sample that's been cut in cross-section. The layers should be smooth. Here we can see the electron image of the sample, and you can see that it's got an egg box-like feature at the surface. So morphologically, in the secondary electron image, we can see that it's not a flat surface. But by collecting the, the element composition and mapping, we can see which elements are distributed throughout that multi-layer composition. This magenta colour is characteristic of silicon. So this particular instrument, just as a, as a bare instrument without the X-ray analysis, equipment on is of the order of £150,000. This is the lowest cost instrument that we've got within this facility. £150,000 probably towards a quarter of a million for ones with more analytical instruments attached to them. So as well as x-ray analysis there are other things like light detectors that you can add on to the basic column of the instrument. We have two scanning electron microscopes within the facility and three transmission electron microscopes and two atomic force microscopes. Any images that you see that have been coloured have been false coloured because the nature of how the image is produced purely produces a grayscale. So it's a binary, all you see is a relative intensity from extremes of black to white. In this case, with the secondary electron image, which is most of the imaging that I've shown, what we're focusing on is actually seeing topographic differences in height. 
There is another image in mode called backscattered electron mode that has various different versions, but predominantly it shows contrast based on relative atomic weight. So something like gold would appear brighter than something like carbon, assuming they're of the same volume within the material. We are relatively unique in terms of having an imaging facility with this number of instruments based purely within a chemistry department. At the University of Bristol, in other departments like physics, medicine, engineering, they have their own electron microscopes or atomic force microscopes for the research that they're particularly focused on. So within chemistry, we have the appropriate microscopes to support the range of research um, by association, the range of research projects available to undergraduates within the chemistry department. And that, for us, ranges from one of the examples, hard materials, obviously like diamond, right the way through to softer polymer and biopolymer materials. Three of the strangest materials. The first one was a challenging one because it was a fossil and it actually originated from the Earth Sciences Department. Normally with electron microscopes we're often having to cut materials down to be able to to look at them. But with this fossil, they didn't want the fossil obviously damaged in any way, so it was literally a case of wedging the fossil into the column and just hit and hope and taking an image. In terms of other samples, we've actually done a collaboration with BBC, um, and that's available as a series of YouTube videos looking at a variety of insects. This is an example when we do face-to-face -face, um, demonstrations, normally gets some people somewhat jittery, so this is actually the mouth parts of a goliath spider. So you can see what appear to be metallic fangs. They're metallic because in, these, in electron microscopes we're firing a beam of electrons at the surface of the sample and the electrons are easily scattered by air. So to allow the electrons to actually only interact with the samples, we evacuate the column. That puts certain restrictions on the nature of the sample. Predominantly, they can't contain water. So biological samples like this and often some of the chemistry samples, the soft polymer gels that are being made, need to be dehydrated first. That does introduce the possible problem of producing artifacts. It also means when we're firing charged particles at a surface, they've got to be conductive. Electrons are carrying a negative charge, and if they hit, impinge on a non-conductive surface, the electrons just build up on the surface, and that interferes with the quality of image we can get. Those can be typically machines or instruments to cut samples down to appropriate sizes, which obviously we weren't able to use on the fossil. We have coating instruments which coat samples for the scanning electron microscope with thin layers of metal so that the electrons being fired at the surface are conducted away. And that's why this sample, in particular, you notice some of the metallic characteristics. So that's not the natural material. Once the sample is safely in the column and evacuated, there's no damage that you can do to the instrument. So everything else is really just an interface with a screen. And there are multiple ways of interacting. So just using the mouse, we can zoom in, zoom out, drag and move the sample around. So there really is very little training needed apart from being able to safely load and unload samples. For the scanning electron microscope, it's literally a couple of hours to get the first introduction into using the scanning electron microscope. The only damage that can be done to the electron microscope is in loading and unloading. So that's what we've shown earlier. That's where there can be mechanical damage to 
the electromagnet to the lenses, to the apertures, 